All right, so the key thing to remember here is that uh, you have this uh, system within each of your cells that allows for um, things that are going to be secreted to be first translated in the ER, then uh, processed in the smooth ER. They form little vesicles. These are little uh, spheres of lipid bilayer. They then get processed through the Golgi for sorting, and then some that are destined to be secreted, such as um, things like hormones um, and transmitters, neurotransmitters. These are uh, will be packaged here. Also, sometimes enzymes. This is really important in the uh, gut and the uh, intestine. Uh, secretory enzymes are, um, in response to a meal, are secreted to help break down the food products so they can be absorbed. Um, and so those are many of those are peptides. Um, many hormones are peptides. Transmitters. Um, some transmitters are not peptides, but they're modified amino acids that also get packaged into these vesicles, and then uh, they can be rapidly released within milliseconds. This is an acute change, typically. Um, these get secreted, and then um, they're uh, either the substrates, in the case of hormones and transmitters, or the enzyme themselves, their concentrations increase rapidly. Okay, so a very important way that um, changes to enzyme kinetics can occur uh, is through secretion, right, pretty rapidly, either by changing the amount of substrate or changing the amount of uh, enzyme. All right, so another way to change the um, uh, amount of enzyme that's available for function is if it's a membrane protein, oftentimes membrane proteins are um, not all in the membrane. So here's the renal tubule again. You see all this red. These are proteins near or in the apical membrane facing the lumen of these cells. Remember, this is the apical part of the cell, the lumen. And um, same here. This is just a closer view of it, apical, and uh, you often have these pr these membrane proteins that do transporting of various things back and forth, such as one important one is salt, moving sodium chloride back and forth. We'll learn much more about those, and the rate at which the transport can occur can be tightly regulated because uh, many of these proteins, instead of being in the membrane, they're actually inserted here into these little vesicles. And the uh, amount of those that are in the membrane, let's just say these are little transport proteins, um, can be changed by inserting or removing these vesicles from the membrane. And so effectively changing the amount of the red protein that's actually available for doing the transport. All right? So this is would be insertion or remove of proteins and this happens very rapidly. Again, this is an acute change. Uh, one example of this will be aquaporin, which is in your collecting duct of your kidney and this transports water. And this will be very important as we'll learn later for the second exam in terms of regulating how much urine you produce and the concentration of that urine. All right, so another rapid change. This is um, increasing or decreasing the amount of an enzyme that's actually available in the location and the substrate here is transport of some molecule um, or ions or water. All right, so the next way to very rapidly change the activity of an enzyme is to um, what's called uh, post-translational modifications. Of course, translation is the process where mRNA gets um, produced into a peptide change and eventually a protein, a mature protein. This happens after translation, right, post-translation. And this is usually covalent modifications, covalent chemical bonds that get uh, formed or broken. And there are many different examples of these. We're just going to highlight two of them. One is phosphorylation here and the other is ubiquitinylation there, right? So these two guys are the ones that we'll be talking about, uh, at least at, for this point for this class. And these are rapid ways, again, rapid ways that you can covalently modify a protein after it's formed. And oftentimes these are reversible, but not always. Um, so you can turn proteins on and off using these two mechanisms. So phosphorylation is one of the most common ways to post-translationally modify a protein. And what happens is first you have some enzyme molecule and it has a few amino acids, most prominently serine and threonine, that have this OH group. And what can happen is the one of the phosphates, the terminal phosphate from ATP, can actually be added onto that OH group to form this huge negatively charged phosphate group. Right? And that remember this the look this phosphate actually came from the ATP itself. 
and then you have ADP, and then you have your protein with the phosphate. The phosphate from ATP is literally transferred to the amino acid. And this, is, this step is called phosphorylation. It's mediated by enzymes called protein kinases. Kinases are what catalyze the addition of the phosphate to the protein. And then you can have dephosphorylation. You have this um, removed uh, here. Here's the phosphate coming off, and you go back to where you started. And the proteins that do this are called protein phosphatases. They catalyze the removal of phosphate groups. Right? And this can cycle back and forth many times during the lifespan of a protein, turning, turning some on, and in some cases turning them off. And each protein can actually be phosphorylated multiple times. And sometimes the combination of the phosphorylation sites is what actually ended up determining where the enzyme is turned on or off. Right? So just keep that in mind. This, this is just covalently modifying, adding a big negative charge to a location in a protein, changes its shape, changes its activity, and this can either turn on or turn off the protein. In many cases, there are multiple phosphorylation sites that work in combination. So you've got about 520 kinases in your genome and about 167 phosphatases. And each of these protein kinases is specialized for phosphorylating um, a few or a single uh, group of proteins and similar with the phosphatases. But it's usually not a one-to-one -one correlation. It's usually each kinase can phosphorylate um, at least a few different proteins, if not many. The same with the phosphatases. All right, so one of the most important ways to very rapidly change the structure and therefore the activity of enzymes is through phosphorylation. Okay, so this is sort of the life cycle of a protein. First you get um, transcription, mRNA, of course. That gets translated and you have your protein produce the birth of a protein. Um, then the protein can be ubiquitinylated. Um, this is the addition of a, of a different covalent modification that's added to a protein. And when that happens, the protein gets destroyed down into amino acids. And those can be used for metabolism or the production of more protein. All right, so the birth and the death of a protein. And the death is mediated by ubiquitinylation. If ubiquitin is added to a protein, it will die. It will get chewed up. All right, so here's ubiquitin. It's the, here in green. This is one of the most um, common um, uh, protein peptides within the cells, very high concentrations. And what happens is you get this series of enzymes. E1 activates the ubiquitin. Um, it actually binds to the E1 enzyme, and then it gets transferred to an E2 enzyme. And then lastly, it gets transferred to the target protein. So here it is now. And in many cases, you have multiple ubiquitins added in a chain. So imagine a bunch of green circles. This is called polyubiquitinylation right here. Once that happens, um, this is recognized by the proteasome. This is like the garbage can of the cell, or garbage disposal for proteins. And it has a lid on it, which only allows proteins that have this chain. Um, and once that happens, this gets broken down to peptides and amino acids um, that can be recycled. Right. So that's the death of a protein. So if you want to rapidly decrease the amount of an enzyme, you can ubiquitinylate it, and then it will go away. Uh, at least some of it will go away, the, some, the parts of it that are ubiquitinylated. And it's actually quite complex. You have about 400 of these in the genome, regulating all of your 40,000 or so proteins. Okay, what about the birth of a protein? Um, if you're going to increase enzyme, one of the most common ways to do it is to transcribe the mRNA for it. If you make the if you transcribe the mRNA for it here, right, it leaves the nucleus, and this will immediate translation, and so that you get more final protein. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. And remember, this is typically takes on the order of um, minutes to hours. So this is a slower process, and it's usually what we refer to as chronic. It's usually on the chronic scale. It really depends on the protein. Some uh, can be translated and processed faster than others. Okay, what mediates the actual um, transcription event here are transcription factors. And these are specialized proteins um, that, uh, of which there's about 500 in the human genome. And this is a DNA element here for your gene. The gene is actually down here. And this is sitting upstream from the gene. It has what's called a promoter. And it has what's called enhancer regions. These are pieces of DNA that sit up front of the start codon, ATG, up here, where the protein starts. <coughs> and uh, what happens is you have all these different, um, this has a specific DNA sequence that is bound by a transcription factor, right? And so this guy here is the transcription factor. 
it binds here and when it does it allows the folding of this DNA and then the recruitment of other enzymes that um, remember this is the transcription factor that allow the uh, transcription of your mRNA to make protein. All right, so I do have a video of this, which I'll show now.